That's it like, was like 16, right? Yeah. Like, that's the 1600s. That's like 400 years ago. Oh, uh, so yeah. Do the Egyptians guys, drink beer? We definitely don't have that accurately. Feel free to DM us and tell us what we your never, King Charles ruled. We never get anything accurate. No. In case right. you guys are, if you're just tuning in, we're more of like drinkers than yeah. like historians. We're not historians at all. It's a spicy one. I didn't know if we were doing the whole thing or not. Oh, no. Did you? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Because I didn't want to. Oh, it's a bitey. It's fucking. It's a birthy. Well, big, small batch. Yeah. Well, hello, everyone. And welcome again to Drunken Demonic. Um, thank you for taking your time from your day or night to come listen to us dumb, drunk bastards. I am Jamie. And this is my friend. Oh, I'm Peter. That's yeah. Peter. Yeah, I always have to introduce him or else he won't say anything. Yeah, I won't. I won't talk the entire episode if you don't introduce me. Aww. I get nervous when you don't introduce me, dude. I won't say Aww. anything. Well, with that being said, this is going to be part two of Paul Ingram, the Satanic Sheriff, or the, the, the Sheriff of St. Pat's. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, you you can't just say Satan. I don't know. If, is that is that racist? If, if I think of Spanish, <laughs> when I think of Satan, no, no, we'll get into that later okay. in this episode. Actually, kind of, yeah, that's kind of rude. All right, it's not. It's not rude, dude. You, I, I get where you're coming from, but it's really it's not rude at all because this whole case gets spun out of control by some mm-hmm. crazy dudes down in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Dicks. All right. Well, we're not going to do our typical banter. Nope, I don't think so. Enough. Do you think? Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Oh, uh, I think we should do some sponsors. Okay. Well, our sponsors um, this time are the same shit we always have. I am sponsored by four Modelos, and R.I.P. to Margaritaville is my koozie. It says my name on it. Let me see here, Jamie. Wow, they made it personally for me. Uh, me and five thousand my other friends on a rack named Jamie. No, just so if you go to Margaritaville, they just have a big, long thing that has almost everyone's names printed out. I think they got a Peter? I bet they have a Peter, dude. Hell yeah, dude. What What about Pete? You think you got Pete? Yeah, it's Peter. It's like a fucking most common name in the world, dude. It's like a John. You're a John. John and Peter, dude. Like a saint. Yeah. Don't forget Michael. There's got to be. Is there a Saint Jamie? James. Dummy. Yeah, but like, no, Jamie. No, there's no Jaime. It's just James. Her name's mm-hmm. James. So, yeah. No, I, I knew that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know. You're okay. James the second? Technically, my dad was James Allen. I'm James John Freeman Knudsen. So I'm not a second because I'm the same middle. I'm not a second either, but everyone calls me repeat. Okay. Really? You know what's super annoying, though? All right. So my dad is Peter Albert Daly. Okay. And I'm Peter Aaron Daly. And all of our mail. Mm-hmm. Is P. Peter A. Daly. Uh-huh. And that's a big time. If you're not just going to be the same. I, do you do the same middle name? I don't know what, like, the seconds and the thirds. Like, do you do the same middle name? I'm yeah, yeah sure. it has to be exact. It has to be exact. Oh, it does? Yeah. Oh, shit. So like, I guess I'm not even a second. You're not. You're just, just fucking boring that's as Peter. Of course, because it's just annoying as shit when I get mail that has Peter A. Daly on it. And my dad fucking opens it thinking it's his. Yeah. Have you thought about not living with your dad? I'm so 35. Oh, I don't live with my dad anymore. <laughs> okay. I have a lovely girlfriend. Okay. We that I to... live with. <laughs> nice, dude. Not legally. <laughs> Government. All right. Well, live with my father. All right. Peter well, Albert. Dude. What, are, what are your sponsors, <laughs> sir? All right. I have Happy Dad as a sponsor. Um, Happy Dad Seltzers. Don't really know a whole lot to say about them other than they're pretty fucking bad. Um, so, why do you do this to yourself 
Every time you're like, I hate seltzers, I fucking hate them, and then you just keep drinking. Just well, I think I'm Modelo, dude. You want a Modelo? The problem is, you want me to trade? You want to trade a Modelo for a Happy Dead? Maybe later. Huh? You let me but know. Here's the deal: is that I think what happens is that I buy seltzers and I drink them all before we get to the episode of the ones that I like. So I'm usually sticking with like, you know, like I love Fruit Smash. I think they're delicious. Give us it. Um, I know. Like Fruit Smash is like one of my favorite seltzers. But by the time we get to podcasting, I'm always drinking the one that sucks because it's the only one that's still left. Yeah, I don't I don't like that either. I'm sorry. No, they're terrible. But they're just they're trying it's doing too much. I don't I, like it's doing too much and just definitely not enough either. Like this is the most boring fucking can I've ever fucking seen in my life. Don't I say that, dude. Dana, Dana White will kick your ass. Dana White doesn't actually have anything to do with these guys. Did you know that? I thought he owns it. He's a part owner, but, like, it's some dudes that had, like, a YouTube channel that, like, I don't know. Some kid was telling me about it the other day because my favorite sweatshirt is a Happy Dad sweatshirt. Thanks for uh, Happy Dad for sponsoring O'Neal's. Oh, nice. I just dropped off a bunch of fucking promo gear. Cool. Uh, for one of the fight nights, and I definitely took the most comfortable hoodie I've ever owned in my entire life. Um, Happy Dad, really? good sweatshirts, bad seltzers. I, I feel like the the grape one, like the Death Row one, which that's not racist, that it's grape and it's not at all. No, I think that one was really good. I haven't tried it. I just have tried, honestly, these are the first Happy Dads I've ever had. And we have pineapple, we have cherry. We have watermelon and we have a lemon lime. And for God's sake, the lemon lime might be the worst drink I've ever had in a can. Really? So they don't serve Fernet in a can. Oh, so don't talk about my girl Fernet like that. <laughs> I feel like. Or Malort. Malort's rough. That's rough. I feel like seltzers are just like too fake of flavor. I feel like. In my perfect world, you'd take a LaCroix, and you'd open it up, drink a little bit of it, dump a little vodka and tequila in it. That, to me, would be better than all those. And I think that's how this all started, because in my opinion, that's kind of what White Claw is. It's very mild on the palate. Yes. Right? So no, like, that Black Cherry one. Tried, well, yeah, the Black Cherry one's different, but like when White Claw first started, they had like the lime, and like I thought it was really mild as far as the palate went, mm -hmm. and then it kind of got like everyone's like oh like people are liking seltzers we should make seltzers that have two flavors obviously it's like kind of like superhero movies yeah. they're like oh fucking you guys love this let's make a billion of them yep you can't have just one it's until like, they're bad and like, then you've got everyone juice. everyone goes back to light beers yep because it's just yeah, it's a classic. There's a reason why it's been around for a thousand years and this has I mean seltzers have been around I I don't know the history of seltzers. Maybe we'll do an episode on that. Just kidding. I'm definitely not going to do that. Um, but I'm like, do alcoholic fight. seltzers like five years ago? Yeah, exactly. There's a reason why it's only been five years since they've been made and not like, I don't know. I'd guess the history on beer is about, I'm going to guess 600 to 1,000 years old. Well, I, in that I'm like that. Not yeah, eating, I like, think, no, I think of like spirits. the, I think of like Gregorian like monks. Yeah, made beer. Yeah, around the thousands. Well, did like when they, they actually got writing? Did they drink beer and stuff with King Charles? Was that a thousand years ago? No, King Charles. Yeah, that like, was like sixteen, right? Yeah, like, that's the sixteen hundreds. That's like oh. four hundred years ago. Oh, so yeah. Did the Egyptians drink beer? We definitely don't have that accurately. Feel free to DM us and tell us what we your never, King Charles ruled. We never get anything accurate. No. In it's case right. you guys are, if you're just tuning in, we're more of like drinkers than yeah. like historians. We're not historians at all. We're just like people that get drunk and then talk about things so our friends can bitch about how wrong we were about it. Yeah. And they'll tell us like, hey, like we think you should do this with your podcast. <laughs> why don't you do, why don't you be better at this? We we're really, start. we're doing our best as... <laughs> As we're just second drunk. or third or fourth job of this as we can do, you know. So we're busy guys. What's your other uh, oh, what's other your sponsor? sponsor? No question. Elijah Craig, small batch, boom. Bitey. It's fucking spicy. You saw at the beginning. Yep. It kind of hurt. Proof. No joke. 
It was again, we mentioned it a couple episodes ago. It's fucking delicious. Yeah. It'll get you. proof It'll grab you by the old nut sack. Fifty percent. It'll nut sack you. Up. Yep. No question. Sorry, I'm talking over you. I was just excited about how nut sacky this uh, Elijah Craig is. Can you define nut sack? Oh, it, it's so bitey that it holds you by the nut sacky. That's what I said. Yep. I can't so? have is that, is that gibberish? No. Okay. No, I think you're dead on, dude. All right. With that being said, um, do you remember what movies we were supposed to watch? No, we're not doing that this episode. Oh, well, didn't you say last uh, at the end of the last episode we were going to watch some movies? Do you want to enlighten me? Because no, straight up, <laughs> I don't. I, I'm poking fun at us because every single episode we talk about <laughs> movies that we're going to watch. And then we get too drunk and we forget which movies. And almost every single episode we're like, did you watch that? No, no, I didn't. We're like, okay, well, tight. Let's watch something different then. And then we don't watch that. So yeah. I thought it'd be funny to riff on you and see if you watched I didn't watch Lovely Dark and Deep or whatever it was called. And, you know. What's it even on again? It feels like on Tubi. Be, you know, Tubi. People sponsor us. Tubi? Tubi? Yeah. For, that's, isn't that free? Yeah. I had, can just go and watch it? Yeah, I had ads, though. That's fine. I don't give a fuck about ads, dude. Right. Ooh. This is the thing, dude. I, like, when Amber gets a little upset, like, oh, why is this ad here? I'm like, do you remember growing up? I, I do remember. Right? Like, ads were everywhere. If you wanted to watch a movie, unless it was in the theaters, there were advertisements. You know why I like ads? Tell me. Because um, I feel like I get to play with my phone in between movies, and it helps me focus more on the movie if I can get a little bit of, like, obsessive dopamine. compulsive. Yeah, straight to, like, you're getting your dopamine like, oh, every 20 minutes. Or here's the other, here's the things that I missed on Instagram. Wow, congrats. And then I'm like, okay, back to the movie. Yeah, dude, I, like, I think of it as, like, a nostalgic thing because, like, people are funny when, like, I've seen memes of, like, Today's generation will never understand the plight of leaving one sibling on the couch while the other siblings go do things. And that one sibling has the 10 second warning. It's like, guys, guys, the show's coming back on. Wow. Drops what they're fucking doing. And like, it is like a fucking madhouse getting back to the couch to watch the show or the movie or whatever. And like each time it was a different sibling that had to sit and be the watch. Out. I don't think I've ever done that. Dude, it was like, I mostly made my sister do it. Shout out to my sister. I don't think I've shouted out my sister yet. She listens and watches every single episode. Well, she loves you, dude. She does love me a lot. And I appreciate that. Yeah. You're a blow Rickus. Cass, love you. Thanks for always watching the TV and telling me when uh, even Stevens is coming back on. Yep. Uh, also, Lizzie McGuire and uh, Hannah Montana. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, do we have anything else? Or should we get right into No. Um, the only other thing I wanted to talk to you about was I, I got kind of mad. At me? Uh, no, I'm always kind of mad at you, but like, not that. Yeah. I, I get over it. I get mad. Okay. I'm sorry. I get mad. It's cool. Um, have you noticed that they're making a shit ton of TV series of slasher? Has this made you mad? Yes, I'm mad. Why? Because I think it's just they're gonna ruin it. Like, why are they? They're making a Jason series called Crystal Lake. They're making a, a Pennywise series called Welcome to Darby, and they already have a Chucky series. Which I don't know if you watched it. It's okay. He's running for fucking mirror or something this day. <laughs> no, he's not. Is that real? No, no, because I. <laughs> I've just seen snippets, but I like haven't watched it. So it, someone tell me if it's actually good. And then I heard that they're doing a Halloween series, too. So I can vouch for all of those, like, except for the Chucky one. I did not know about the Chucky one, and it's interesting that it's already out. You're upset about this. Yes. I'm pumped about it, dude. And of course you're fucking pumped about it. You love it. We'll see. Maybe they're good. I, I... They don't have to be good. What it is is that, like, the genre is getting breath. It's becoming, like... More like and a, more popular. Like that? Is horror getting popular? Horror is growing, dude. I can tell you we're, that, we're on the front side of this. We're only 10 years late on it, but we're on the front side. Well, I've been doing this my whole damn life. I know. Watching it, yes, but we're talking about it. Well, That's a different point. Okay, so, so you're I'm, excited about I'm excited, dude. And like, and we've talked about this because I don't 
like it's hard for me to find like a horror movie that I really don't like. And I've name seen, one, I, name your worst horror movie of all time right now. Go. The worst horror movie I've seen of all time. Don't say Sleepaway Camp because that's scary to me. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna have to like think. You know, uh, think of a shitty. Just say a shitty one right now. No, no. I'm What's a shitty gonna one? Say a shitty horror movie. I'm gonna say a movie that I am 100 percent completely confused by is the house that Jack built. I just saw it recently. It's one of the fucking weirdest movies I've ever seen. I've never even heard about it. It's not a horror movie, but it's in the horror genre. This is this is off topic. I want you to name a horror movie you don't like. Man. The problem is... is Terrifier 3? I didn't like X, dude. I didn't like X. Okay. And there we talked go. about it. There we go. Um, It's so funny because, like, I love horror movies, and I love, like drinking stuff and it seems like whatever the fuck we end up talking about on this show i'm like the bad guy where i'm like oh that like wasn't that good and 100 percent, i'm the guy that usually is 100 percent like oh this is my favorite like this is my new favorite thing just because i just watched it yesterday like that kind of stuff so it's really interesting that i'm always That's like it. you didn't like x i did not like x i can tell you that i've tried to watch pearl like four times and I've had, to, no, I've had to turn it off. Turn it off? And I'm just like, it's just not appealing to me. Is it the weird-ass chick? I don't know. Mia Goth? Yeah, Jared Goff's sister. Yes, Jared Goff, as we talked about before. Um, <laughs> no, I just, it's... What do you, know, like, what do you not like about it? Because I've seen it pop up, and it's really funny. It looks I like just don't... Something in my brain doesn't want to watch it. And I felt like it was work. I felt like I was like, I had to watch this because of the podcast. And I was like, my brain was like, I don't want to watch this. Okay. I want to watch a different horror movie. I have to ask, what is the font? There's... It, oh, but I know the font. No, it's but big like, and white. Pearl that's it. Is, it looks like... Hel- Helvetica. No, dude. I don't know the fucking font. It mean? looks like... <laughs> Pearl looks like it's written for that word. Pearl. What does that mean? I'm I'm no, gonna look okay. it up we here. Figure it out. Wait. We'll put we'll put it up on the screen right in there. I just meant it's big and white. That's it. I don't know what the font is, but it it just there's not a font there. It seems oh shit. I'm bad at this. Do you know what you're doing? No, not at all. Have you used an iPad before? Uh, I'm actually pretty bad at this. Um, my computer... It's right there, there. Right there. I can see it. Pearl. It's cursive. It's, it's cursive. It, it's cursive, that's but not it's like, a... it has some some kind it, of font that is... It looks really like a normal font. It looks like I know. something that would be popular, and it makes sense, because Pearl is the old lady in X. Um, this is something from, like, the 1930s or 40s. Um, I think of, like, you know... Weirdly, oh brother, where art thou? Like Dapper Dan and stuff like that had this like weird cheesy kind of cursive on it, and I never once like thought about that. Like, ooh, what's this weird ass font they're using? I did think about how are they going to tie Max Seed into these? Maybe I have to watch Pearl that way I understand. But like the end of X didn't really make me think that anything was going to be new. Like, who's Maxine? Maxine is the third movie oh. in the trilogy. Yeah, but who's Maxine in X? I don't think there is a Maxine. Okay. That, that's the movie coming out called Maxine, and Mia Goth plays the main character, and she's in the She's got to be a daughter. I assume so, but I don't understand yeah. that. There was nothing at the end of X that made me think that there was going to be another movie, other than they told me there was going to be another like on the internet. Yeah, and, and I was surprised when you told me that there was like a trilogy. Yeah, it's a trilogy. It comes out July 5th. And we talked about it. It was like, hey, this is like, yeah, I could tell that there was some weird time thing going on to where like it makes sense. Mia Goff is playing three separate characters in three different timelines. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that it's going to be like some weird multiverse shit? No. I just think they just make, they use an actress to play three different characters in a lineage yeah yeah that makes sense this one's in the 80s so i don't understand because the, the well that's when x takes place no, x was in the 70s. 70s yeah x was in the 70s pearl was in like the 1930s yeah or 20s that makes sense and then maxine 
I digress. Well, then that's all I had to banter with you about. Dude. So I feel like we're going to have, you got some good quality uh, podcasting. <laughs> so you, you said you had a recap to kind of bring us back from the. I do. Well, without further ado, oh, we're cheers in. Well, cheers. I don't want to get too drunk because I feel like you, when you do a lot of talking, I just keep drinking and then I'm like, have to listen to myself when I'm editing. I'm like, oh, so here, here, I'm a dad. Just know that that is felt both ways. You're not the only person that. You also think you're really drunk? I don't think you're, oh, you yeah, don't seem sure. really drunk. It's not that I sound really drunk. It's that my brain is drunk and it keeps saying the same fucking shit over and over again. You just say, mm, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I, I don't know about That's that. when I know you're drunk. Because you go, mm, I don't know. So n- n- listen for it. I'm ready to roll, dude. Let's hear it, dude. Are you good? Mm, I don't know. I think I know. How will I know? Dude, <laughs> all right. Did you just roll away? <laughs> okay, I'm done. You stop me when you're ready. Okay? I'm depending on you. Obi-Wan. Star Wars. What do they say? We're, we're depending on help me, Obi Wan. Help you're me, Obi Wan. You're my only hope. Yeah, that that like that. Okay. Help me, Jamie. You're my only hope. Quit looking at my tits. Don't fat shame me. I'm not, <laughs> dude. Just because I'm looking at your cool ass shirt that you're wearing, everyone. We're talking about Colts. We're not talking about Colts. No, we're not. We're talking about Dell. Let's discuss where we left off last episode. How about that? We've talked about Paul Ingram, the only man to have ever been been accused, accused, tried, and convicted in charges relating to the satanic panic. We've also discussed the history of the Ingram family, notably Paul's wife, Sandy, and their five children, one of which died in a state facility after being diagnosed with spinal meningitis. We've discussed the alleged abuse. I had that. You have spinal meningitis? I had it when I was a kid. So I'm so blind. I don't know whether or not to take you seriously. <laughs> Dead serious. I had spinal meningitis. When I was like... Who's your dad? What's your guy's name? My dad's... His name is James. Oh, okay. Just talked about this. this Quit repeating yourself. This person's name is Paul. So I got involved Paul. in the story. <laughs> but yeah, I had spinal meningitis. I got... I, well, I mean, like, how many children do you have in your family? You're one of five? Uh, Two? Two? Don't you have a bunch of sisters? And they're stuck. Uh, that'll happen. But I had that. Okay. Two, two or three weeks old. Almost died. <laughs> no and shit. Now I'm blind, yeah. Is, is that why you're blind? That's why I have thick glasses. You have meningitis? I had. I'm cured. I was cured. How do you get cured? Doctors. Why didn't they just do that with her? I don't know. It was different. It was, I had it in the 80s. So. She was born like around the same time you were. I don't understand how you were just, you're fine, dude. Look at you here. I'm a miracle. This is the picture of wellness. You can tell. Yeah. He's like pretty flexible. His, his spine can bend. I'm not red at all from the alcoholism. That's for sure. No, it's just sun. I it's got hot in here. No, dude. I got sun from mountain biking today. Yeah, it's also all hot. Right. You went to pies. You ate a Philly cheesesteak. It's true. Then you went and sat outside and mm-hmm. went mountain biking. Picture of health, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Didn't die. All right. So, who had meningitis? Um, the daughter of Paul, who was born as a twin of Erica. Mm-hmm. Um, and Erica was the sassy, the, the sassy one? Daughter. Or the, the, the goofy one? Um, I would say that Erica is... The sassy one. She that was is. the one that was me, right? From last episode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She was like, hey, like, I'm really popular and cool. And Julie is the other daughter yeah. who's younger, but she's like, kind of like, she was maybe a little more. She was more like, yeah. Heckin' chill. Yeah. Um, but, anyways, Erica did have a twin um, and she definitely died. That's real sad. R.I.P. Yep. Sorry. Um, we have discussed the alleged abuse of the two Ingram daughters, Erica and Julie, at the hands of their own father and a few of his co-workers and friends. So far in the story, Jim Raby was implicated by both Paul and the girls just mentioned as a co-conspirator in the assaults. 
These assaults allegedly took place primarily at a rotating poker night that was held sometimes at the Ingram household. I will continue to use the word allegedly whenever I remember for the rest of the story, okay. not just this episode, because allegedly. it's entirely possible that this is going to be three. Jamie says I can't make four you episodes. Can't this four. You can't do but it. But possibly four episodes. To draw the line. No, you have to draw the line right now, or dude, else every episode will be four parts. I'm just saying, dude. We're having a conversation. This is all important. As we drop back into the story, we are in the middle of one of Paul Ingram's earlier interrogations. Present in the interrogation rooms are Detective Joe Vukic and Brian Shoning, as well as Doctor Richard Peterson, who is present at Paul's own request and has searched to recover the memories that detectives and Doctor Peterson claimed. He was repressing. Keep in mind, at this point, Paul has given the detectives multiple confessions to the crimes that he that are being alleged. However, the confessions are riddled with inconsistencies, as well as subjunctive phrasing that certainly puts the validity of the confessions into doubt. Let's go right now into the interrogation room where Dr. Peterson has offhandedly mentioned the term black magic to Paul, and detectives are looking for some sort of real confession. As Paul Ingram sat for hours trying to give to detectives the confessions that they so dearly wanted, Ingram was pressed for information on the case and became physically and emotionally agitated and asked for his pastor. At this, detectives pried Paul and told him that the only way he would be forgiven for his sins would be to confess. At this, Paul went into like a fugue state, which is... Described as like a form of like hypnosis, um, the detectives described him like rolling back in his chair, shaking his head, and his eyes rolled back in his head. Um, like evangelical Christians? That is exactly what this is like, Jamie. We will go back to that so many times in this case. I'm cured! Whoa! I'm a faith healer! The fact that people are like, oh, we are... Uh, spouting out things as we kind of imagine them, like speaking in tongues, will be a concurrent theme. What a little throughout shit! All of these episodes. It reminds me of that meme that's like, "What happened?" He's like, "I'm not gay no more." <laughs> He's like at the church, and the guy like puts his hand on him. <laughs> and he falls over backwards. I'm no longer gay. It's exactly like, no. like that. What so a, what a heap of shit. No offense to any evangelical Christians listening. The Ingram family is a Pentecost, like Pentecostal, which is just a form, like a, a sect of um, evangelical Christianity. One of the 900 Pentecost different... makes a lot. 900 different variations of Christianity. That yeah, Jesus all... died for our sins, so but I... not like they said. No, nah, dude, this is different. Totally, we all know. Totally different. <laughs> but, oh... All right. Paul's fugue state uh, relayed that he can see Julie lying on the floor on a sheet. He further detailed her being hogtied and being watched and abused by other men, as well as claiming there may have been a camera and it was suggested by the other or there may have been a camera after that that was suggested by other detectives. He claims in this image, or this memory, to see Ray Risch as the op operator of the camera. Risch was a mechanic for the Washington State Patrol and was well known to those in the Sheriff's Department. Shortly after this re revelation, Associate Pastor John Bertoon arrived along with Gary Preble, an attorney of devout Christian faith who Paul had asked to speak with. Preble had no experience with criminal law, but again, took the case regardless. John Bertoon e echoed the sentiment of detectives, claiming, one, that God will save him if he is to confess, and that, two, the memories will also return if he confesses. Paul again is pushed by detectives to continue confessing to the crimes so that the memories will return and he will be able to be forgiven, this time under the persuasion of not just the detectives, but Dr. Richard Peterson, his own lawyer, Gary Preble, and associate pastor John Bertoon. At the close of the interview, Ingram claims, boy, it's almost like I'm making it up, but I'm not. It's like I'm watching a movie, a horror movie. Super weird. 
I don't know why the fuck he said that. I supposed to say? I don't know. I just looked. Who was this? <laughs> oh, that that was that uh, was Ingram. The, the literal. I was like, oh yeah, it seems I like I'm making part. this whole thing up. But I'm not. I promise you, I'm not. The whole thing smells like shit. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the Fuck two cops who are implicated in the interrogation so far. Jim Raby was at one point the lead investigator for sex-related crime, crimes for the Thurston County Sheriff's Department. The position of the detectives who would interview Paul as well as Raby himself. He eventually left the force due to severe narcolism, narcolepsy. Sorry. What's, narcolepsy. What's so narcolism? I don't know what narcolism like, is. It's like falling asleep and also being full of yourself. Narcolism. <laughs> Narcissist. Narcolism. It's, it's a narcissist that has narcolepsy. <laughs> yeah. I got Man, it. I'm the fucking best. <laughs> yeah. I win. Y'all suck, dude. All right. Let's move on. <laughs> He actually success. So we're talking about Jim Raby here. Yep. He had actually successfully lobbied for legislation that would allow sex crimes to have a statute of limitations for seven years instead of the previously legislated three years. Julie claimed that another time that Raby had come into her room, raped her and cut her with a knife. Raby actually ended up in the sheriff's department that day for a meeting with the local Kiwanis and had asked if he could help the investigators with the case using his proximity as pa to Paul as a way to get him to speak. It was at this point that Vukic, Detective Vukic, informed Raby that Paul had named him as a conspiracy, as a conspirator in his sexual abuses. Raby didn't initially deny this, but instead slumped down and loosened his tie. Detectives took this as an I'm caught type of look. Raby also claimed to not remember any of the crimes he had been accused of and claimed that perhaps he had a dark side that he was unaware of. Shonen claimed that there were photographs of the allegations. He had an eerily similar response and that he believed the detectives, if they told him that that was true, that he must have just not remembered, but believed that it was true. Mm -hmm. Like Ingram, Raby also asked to be administered a polygraph test. Raby believed that cops in his position were presumed guilty until proven innocent, something that certainly shed light on how the, investigated continue, the investigation continued to unfold. Richard Peterson was the one that brought up the idea of a cult to Raby. He also referred to the fact that an ex-cop in prison was a guaranteed death sentence. Even if he got off the charges, his life would always be destroyed. We'll go now to our second uh, conspirator, Ray Risch. Again, mirroring the same responses as the other two, he replied to the detectives, presenting evidence by saying, I wasn't present that I know of unless I blocked it out of my head. It's so crazy. Like, all of these guys are like, I don't think I did that, but, but maybe. Which, like, we're thinking of detectives or people involved with the police department in, like, the mid to late 70s mm -hmm. and early 80s. I think they were just all fucking drunks. And they were like, fuck, man, I don't know. I've been drunk a lot. I could have done weird shit. I don't really... I, I'm pretty sure I didn't do any of that, but... I also think that they know what to say to kind of like get off and make things confusing because that's their job is to do that is to interrogate people that's fair that's right All however right. you're coming at this from a totally different approach than i am well yeah this is what different brains we have do. our opinions on yeah. this case i i, just, I don't know and actually, i think that you have as valid opinion as i do on this because oh thank you well yeah but like <laughs> you've you've done some research on this and like the research that I've done is mostly just into the story, not necessarily like the reasoning for it. So like, I understand you're here to play devil's advocate for the entire well, like, portion of the show that like, I'm kind of making an argument one way and you're pushing it another way. And I think that's important to make well, sure that well, that's represented. Yeah. Well, the way I see it is like, you've got two daughters hmm? claiming 
claiming that this happened, but nothing is proven. Mm -hmm. And then you have cops manipulating a system, saying things, maybe, I don't know, I did, and then hearing all this stuff from the preacher saying mm -hmm. it. As long as, like, you'll go to heaven as long as you confess and stuff like that. Um, it all of it's so wishy washy, and there's like no, like, for like, there's no definite answer. No, this, so entire... I would, I would always go, I'm gonna side with, yeah, the girls the over victims. the cops, right? And I think that that's the problem with this case is that it lives in the gray where there is not a black and a white, it is 100%. There's something going on. You as a listener have to decide whether or not like the claims that are being made, and it's not just all of the claims one way or all of the claims another way, which claims to be taken seriously and which claims are to be dismissed. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll get back into it. Um, detectives told each man that the other man had implicated them. That means Vukic told Paul Ingram as well as Raby, as well as Ray Rish, that the other men had said that they were involved uh, with pretty much massive amounts of sexual abuse uh, on specifically uh, Paul Ingram's daughters. So Paul said Ray was doing it. And Ray said the other guy. So Paul is at the head of this whole thing. Yeah. He is saying that these men did it. Now, when Ray Rish and uh, Jim Raby are brought in, detectives are telling them, oh, Ray Rish. Like, so you say you're Jim Raby. You're getting interviewed. They're saying, oh, Ray Rish said that you were involved with this. That's a typical. And Jim Raby is saying, well, no, like. I think that maybe, you know, Ray Rish was involved with that or something like that. Detectives are pinning the three against each other. suspects right now against each other. Um, on December 2nd of 1988, Paul asks for an exorcism because he claims that there must be a demon inside of him. He recalls a new memory at this time. He claims that Raby pushed uh, him, like Paul Ingram, down the stairs and then raped his son, Chad. After further investigation, detectives interview Chad, and he denies completely having ever been sexually abused. Spurred on by uh, Richard Peterson, the detectives, and John Bertoon, Paul produced some more memories. Bertoon assured Paul that anything he was imagining must be true because God would not allow him to see things that didn't happen. Ingram claimed that he saw people in robes kneeling around a fire. He believes the devil may have been there in a cloth helmet. Ingram also recalled standing on a large platform looking down into the fire. He held a large knife in which was used to sacrifice a black cat. He also claimed that the cat may have been a doll. All of this was said in a third party manner, as in, like, I think, I see, I feel, this reminds me of type speaking. Ingram also produced a memory of him and Ravy murdering a prostitute in 1983 outside of, outside of Seattle. Uh, they pretty much implicated, or at this point, Paul implica implicates himself as, like, potentially a suspect for the Green River Killer. Um, upon request, Shoney asked the Green River Task Force, who was actively investigating these crimes at the time, to look into Paul's confession. They found no corroborating evidence to tie Paul to any murders that have ever taken place with the Green River Killer. After Paul's continued, revel continued revelations, Erica claimed to a friend that Paul was saying too much and was bringing up things she wished she didn't have to remember. She wished he would just be quiet. Erica also now changed her story in claiming that Paul abused her every night of the week before she left her home in the late September of 1988. At this point, Detective Laura Lee Thompson interviews Julie. She is regarded as the best sex crime investigator 
since Jim Raby left, left the force. Thompson claimed that Julie was the most traumatized victim she had ever seen, finding it incredibly difficult to get anything out of Julie, where Thompson usually was incredibly successful with much more difficult victims, i.e. young children. She claims to believe that Julie must have been tortured. On December 8th, Chad visits Paul in jail. Paul got upset with Chad as Chad couldn't remember having been abused. This is brought up on Paul's earlier confession. Paul claimed, you have to get it out. Chad recalled that Paul was like a totally different person while being in jail. After this, Chad was interviewed by Richard Peterson, the psychologist. He continued denying that he had been abused, no matter how hard Peterson pushed, telling him that he has buried the memories because they are too painful. Chad relays that the only time he remembers suffering abuse was Paul calling him a loser one time. It's rude. It's a little rude, but like... Nothing you can't handle. Fucking dads in the 80s, dude. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I was probably sitting there playing video games. He's like, get the fuck up, you loser. No video games. I guess 1985. That's video games, right? This is 1983. The timeline's a little loose here. (laughs) Okay. Chad's the youngest Uh son. Uh, Except for Mark. Mark is way younger than everyone. (sighs) Um, But anyways. There's too many people. There's five of them. There's five kids. Can you you do me a favor? Yeah. Will you just say, like, son, Chad. Or the son of Paul, Chad, or like the daughter of Paul, yeah. Julie. Yeah. Instead of saying Julie, or instead of saying Jim Raby, just like kind of like. I'll clarify who these people are because. Oh, yeah, it's, good. it's getting hard to follow for me. Oh, there's so many fucking people I know in this it's case. Oh, oh, my God. All right. All right. Just say that. Son, yep. The son of Paul, Chad. Yep. So even if you repeat it, it'll help me. So, um, the son of Paul, Chad, uh, claimed that one time Paul called him a loser. Mm-hmm. Peterson. The doctor replied, you can remember what happened. You can choose to remember if you want to. At this point, Detective Shoning mentioned, the memories are there. They prodded him into admitting that he had mental health problems. And they overanalyzed every word that he said. Then they took Chad's dreams and did some dream analysis. Chad recalled hearing voices outside his window. Chad is the son. Uh-huh. I, I don't know if I need to clarify. Not that. every time. Good now. Yeah. yeah. Just when you bring someone new, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I know I so fucked it up again. Yeah, yeah. You're all right. We're all good. Uh, Chad recalled hearing voices outside of his window, but claimed that that would have been impossible since he slept on the second floor. This led investigators to coerce Chad into admitting that every time a train would go by, a whistle would blow and a witch would come to open up the window and at times come through and just stand on Chad's chest. The police forced Chad to recollect situations that never happened, and while Chad admitted that, there, that what detectives were feeding him was possible, he did not believe them to be real. Eventually, detectives would get Chad, Chad to admit, admit that in these dreams, a witch would be on top of them with their penis in his mouth. Chad recalled having a dream of the seven dwarves as a child, but this was turned so that it eventually became a memory. You say a witch? Yeah. With yeah. a penis? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a warlock. So that's not necessarily true. Um, this is also dude witches? part of the case. Uh, a witch would fly up to the window uh-huh. and transform in front of him to have a dick. Trans witch. <laughs> Probably. Yep, trans wishes. Trans wishes. Winning, winning NCA swimming competition. <laughs> Oops. Like, this is like a real thing. No, like, I'm not even kidding. Because this is part of the contention that the detectives have. They're like, hey, like, you said a witch, a woman witch flew up to your window. And he said, yes. And then they would fly in through the window and then they'd stand on your chest. And he said, yes. And then they're like, where'd the dick come from? You're like, oh, they'd straight up just transform into a guy. And all of a sudden there'd be a dick. How old was Chad when this happened? Uh, 11 or 12. Yeah, no shit. He would just like make stuff up like that when he was getting prodded by like cops. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, Ronius. Actually, I'm wrong. Chad is 16 at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if that changes things for you. Um, a little bit. 11. I feel like an 11 year old would lie a lot more when being put on, under pressure than a 16 year old. Yeah. Chad has like also continuously denied that anything uh, happened. Exactly. And then they're like, hey, well, what about this dream you had? What happens remember in the dream? Remember that witchy dream? Can you think of a thing that happened ever? What's happening in your brain? What how, does that tie, how does that tie him to, into him getting molested? Just because he had a dream about a witch? Yes. Is a dick. So they're saying it, that, like... It must be true. They're, the thing is, is, like, the whole point of this case is that there is severe, like, coercion on the side of detectives pushing, leading all that stuff on their witnesses. Do they get money if they close a case? Is it just like no, brownie points? Notoriety, though. No. Yeah. They have the only case in America to an admitted Satanist. I thought there was more than one. Nope. I thought there was like three people that got out convicted during the Satanic Panic. Not convicted. There were lots of people charged. No one was ever convicted. And we'll get to eventually how those charges were actually put out. Mm -hmm. Because as the charges eventually came down, prosecutors can't prove satanic ritual abuse. It's no. not real. In the eyes of the courts. Yeah. Well, they, they can't prove it. So, and we'll get to what Char Paul is eventually charged with. How much heavy metal was he listening to? Zero. Zero. He listened to a lot of like, uh, man, what would be the, the gospel music at the time? Um, and Murray. And I don't, I don't, you would know better than I would do. She's saying Rose Garden. Okay. Yeah. And then she did gospel albums after that. I don't know the eighties very well. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it to you. Okay. I'm just, I'm just curious. No, no rock music at all. I don't know if you remember this in the last episode. Straight up, the kids were not allowed to no. listen to rock music. While they were banging on the on the water bed, I get it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, him and his wife were like having like crazy and then now, sex like, on the water bed. The yeah. kids were like supposed to sit and listen to like, I don't know. The noises. Gospel tunes. Yeah. Like Ray Charles, like gospel tunes. So, and like the satanic, the one of the biggest things in the satanic painting was like, watch for your kids. Make sure they're not listening to too much heavy metal. Exactly. So then the, why did this become just be... I don't, it's confusing for me. The whole case is it's it's confusing. confusing. It's like, okay, so. All right, we'll keep going. All right, so Chad has expressed this dream, and he makes clear that it's a dream. Expressing how sorry the detectives felt for Chad, Peterson also claimed that he should get back at his father and the others. He claimed, and I'll tell you something, you have the right to sue these fuckers and get as much as you want from them. Peterson claimed he could use the money to go to college or buy a nice car. Chad responded, well, I have a pretty nice car. To which Peterson responded, do you have a BMW? The transcripts with Chad are so obviously biased that, like, I can't help but, like, bring it up because it's. I think one of the worst cases of like they're looking and they're fishing for information that obviously isn't there, but they keep pushing, trying to find whatever resources they can. Um, Chad would eventually pick out Raby and Rish from a photo lineup as people he recognized. Not surprising. The poker parties were very much a real thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that was totally made up. But he claimed that Raby was the man who ended up being the witch in his dreams. He claimed Rish had assaulted him in the basement of the Ingram house. Although Chad's interview would also take 10 minutes at a time to remember these events or create them. So like every time they're like, hey, what did Jim Raby do? And he'd be like, a lot of the interview sessions that we bring up in this are spent with their head down, and this is not just Chad, this is Paul, this is Sandy, the wife, both daughters, everyone that's interviewed by police, like, they take forever to come up with these confessions, because, in my opinion, 
They're coming up with conventions. They're making, making it all up. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, we'll go briefly into uh, Richard Peterson. This was his first time being involved in a police, invest- or a police Rich, investigation. Richard Peterson is? He is the doctor, the psychologist, yeah, exactly. that has come in to help Paul remember the things that he can't remember. Okay. Um, both him and uh, John Bertoon, who is the associate pastor of their church, mm-hmm. uh, both of their presences becomes a key aspect of the successful defense of Rich and Raby. There were just so many issues with the prosecution's case. Several law enforcement officials were being investigated by their own department. Right. The inclusion of Peterson and Bertoon showed an obvious push towards the detectives having a preconceived belief in what was the truth of the case without actually consulting the evidence. There were leading witnesses, victims, and even perpetrators revealing information that was patently false just to fit the narrative and not make not just a better story for the courts, but for the papers as well. The accused were admitting to far more than even the victims were. So you have Paul saying, oh, yeah, and I did all this crazy shit. And the victims are like, oh, he did this and this. And Paul's claims are like way bigger, um, which never, ever happens. Um, He's still got that demon in him. He's been exercised. I thought he said he requested it. Yeah, no, it's already happened. It happened that same day. It's fucking crazy, this whole case. (laughs) Like literally in a jail cell. They fucking did an exorcism to where the associate pastor came in and like, yeah, we'll get back into that later because it's super interesting how Paul compartmentalizes okay. his yeah. entire brain. Did they ever like get him checked for mental health problems? Yes. Okay. Kind of. Not really. It's kind of weird. Okay. Just... Um, all right. So the investigators went in uh, trying to prove that not only were they... Uh, the accused guilty, but they were just the start of a vast nationwide satanic conspiracy. Peterson was well familiar with the term satanic ritual abuse. Mm -hmm. From here on out, I'm pretty much going to use the term SRA because you don't want to say it. It makes sense. I'll fuck it up. I'll fuck it up. I've been drinking. We're doing our thing. I don't want to say satanic ritual abuse every time because I'll definitely fuck it up. SRA. Totally fine. You're so hard on yourself. SRA, Satanic Ritual Abuse. Got it. Thanks, Chef. <laughs> All right. In the mid 80s and mm-hmm. late 80s, the country experienced what was later referred to as the Satanic Panic. Thousands of individuals across the country and world even admitted to having been involved in a vast network of sexual abuse and rituals that were done in the name of Satan. But where did the Satanic Panic begin? Mm. In 1980, there was a book published by Lawrence Padzer, and it was called Michelle Remembers. In this book, Padzer, a psychiatrist, details the events relayed to him by his patient, Michelle Smith. Padzer discusses his own sessions which, in which Smith recalls black magic ceremonies, tortures, and, satanic, or, and sexual abuse by members of a satanic cult, of which her mother was a member. The book has largely been discredited as fictitious, as no corroborating evidence has ever been found that connects the book to actual events. It also doesn't help that the book's credibility is tainted as Pazder would go on to marry Michelle Smith, his client. Maybe a little bit of like a shady dude. Mm-hmm. Um, the you book say make shit up so oh, you yeah, make, sure. so you can you sell books. Shit ton of money, let's fucking go. Um, the book would not only serve as a guide for those claiming to have been a victim of SRA, but also for those in the field of psychology and psychiatry. Um, Peterson, of course, was familiar with the book and was also aware of the notoriety that was attached to having such patients. He was actually he had actually conducted a survey in the Seattle and Tacoma area of therapists to see how many had received reports of SRA as it came to be known. In the survey, it found that a quarter of therapists interviewed had treated uh, patients with SRA. One fourth. What was not known at the time was that Erica Ingram had read Michelle Remembers. 
When investigators talked about this with Erica, she claimed to have only read the first chapter of the book. However, the woman she had borrowed the book from had expressed that Erica had told her she read the entire book. Erica claimed to police that she could not finish the book because its contents were too shocking and brought back memories that she wished not to address. The satanic panic brought themes of satanic ritual abuse and repressed memory to the mainstream. Earlier that year, in January 1988, the McMartin preschool case had dominated the headlines. You know about this? Mm-mm. The McMartin case? All right. We can talk about that later, or you want to keep going? Oh, I'm going right now. Oh, you're going right into it. Yep. Peggy McMartin and six other child care workers were charged with molesting hundreds of children over a number of 10 years. Children reported they were, they were routinely abused as well as sacrificed and used in satanic rituals in the basement of a preschool in California. That's 10 a year. Oh, that number is honestly pretty low. Um, there was no solid evidence that any abuse, let alone abuse in the name of Satan, had taken place during this case. And the charges were dropped or resulted in a mistrial for everyone involved. But the satanic, or the uh, Mick Martin, oh, literally, no one was charged. It was like a huge deal. We will eventually get into like the McMartin case, or we can talk about it maybe as like a short <laughs> thing. But like, it is very juvenile, what I say that the kids experienced. Um, they like claimed like, oh yeah, we were like flushed down toilets and swirled around a bunch and... Then we were held in the basements where hundreds were killed. Was there any proof of kids being killed? Zero. Zero evidence on any front. It's why every single part of this, uh, all the charges were dropped. There were, I think, 10 different people uh, charged, and not a single uh, person was convicted. Again, highlighting how important this Ingram case was. There were people that were admitting that they did it. Okay. The McMartin case, in conjunction with Michelle Remembers, sparked sparked a nationwide hysteria and reporting abuse at the hands of satanic cults. Again, in 1988, a paper had been published titled, A New Clinical Syndrome, Patients Reporting Ritual Abuse as Children by Satanic Cults. Of note from this paper, the authors deduced that for the most part, the instances relayed to them by patients who suffered both SRA as well as multiple personality orders were true. I find it especially interesting that most commonly referenced events perpetrated upon among the victims were interviewed were being force-fed drugs. It does bring to mind the MK Ultra experiments and how drugs were used to fracture a person's personality, pretty much breaking a person's brain by giving them for the most part, LSD. Um, I assume so. I yep. assume so. You have people from Whitey Bulger to... You know Whitey Bulger? No. Gang leader out of Boston. Um, as well as uh, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, was also involved with uh, the MK Ultra trials, mm-hmm. where pretty much they use acid to try to, like, fracture a person's personality to be hidden behind their normal personality so that they could send U.S. people into Russia and have them be spies and they could never be interrogated to have information presented that they were actually U.S. citizens. They would just end up bombing an entire uh, building instead. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's what happened, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Unabomber was part of this test and then afterwards, like years later. Yeah, he was definitely like, I mean, he didn't, do a ton of like building bombing. It was very small bombing, but definitely blowing up people's hands and killed a couple people. I'm not trying to like lessen how devastating the Unabomber was, but he wasn't as successful as he wanted to be. So what you're it's saying? So much target. You're saying is if you take LSD, then you'll probably blow people's hands off. Yeah, no question. Don't take it. I wouldn't take LSD. I would never. Even once. Nope. All right. Uh, where am Got I? Got, I got, got lost, your tongue. Man. Talk about LSD? Yeah, yeah. God's uh, watching. <laughs> from this, a different opinion was proposed. George Ganaway saw that perhaps there was a connection between those suffering from multiple personality disorders concocting stories of SRA 
due to their highly suggestible state. Ganaway also concluded that due to this paper, oftentimes therapists would unwillingly guide their patients into false memories of SRA. While he did not discount that any abuse had happened, he believed oftentimes that patients who expressed having been victims of SRA had done so and had done so under the false and misleading uh, preferences of their therapist. Ganaway noted that it was quite possible for these things to happen when interviewees or patients were trying to make the therapist or the interviewer happier by giving them the response that they were looking for. In a separate poll done in California in 1991, it was found that over half of social workers not only believed SRA to be real, but believed in a vast nationwide network of conspirators that not only lived in communities, but were perceived as upstanding or high-level citizens in their own communities. All this brings us to the question, is satanic ritual abuse real? Some people... No. No? (laughs) (laughs) Some people liken the claims of SRA to those of alien abductees. Of course. Some claim that by creating such dramatic events... It allows survivors of actual abuse to have a less mundane and therefore meaningful story. This also brings into question the validity of recovered memory. The primary driver of this entire case. In one case, a doctor reported having hypnotized his patient to disclose events regarding his abduction by aliens. While this doctor did not believe that there were traumas in this person's life, or while the doctor did believe that there were traumas in this person's life, he didn't believe that his patient had been abducted by aliens. However, after a hypnosis session, his patient showed marked signs of improvement after having disclosed the traumatic memories that plagued his psyche. The doctor wrote a report in which he detailed that his patient was just as convinced when he left the session as when he arrived that these traumatic events had actually happened. He actually had been victims of abuse, had been a victim of abuse who spoke with the same conviction as those of a patient who had claimed to have been abducted by aliens. From this. Okay. From this, the doctor deduce that as a clinician, it may not matter whether or not the alleged traumas actually occurred. It may be more important to allow the patient to process the information regardless of how true it is. So if your patient believes that they were abducted by aliens, let them talk about it because they need to express it. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's something that they are internalizing as traumatic to them. And do they still they process it. Do they still like take it as evidence though? So this is that's where I'm looking. Ties into our case. Okay, but this is where I'm so confused. Outside of our case. Okay. These, are, these are reports that have been, or like reports and studies that tie into our case, but don't actually, that, that are not members okay. of our case. No, no I know that. Things. I was just like, okay, go on. This is kind of how we get to the fact that like, something may have happened. And this is, we've discussed he this got a an, bit. He got adopted. Polygram got abducted, and that's what you're leading into. No. I think that you've mentioned this before. I think that it's entirely possible that the girls experienced some sort of sexual abuse and in a need to be heard created these wild claims to be taken seriously yeah, that, or to have some attention paid to them. That makes sense. And that's kind of what, why I bring up those other reports. Okay. Um, in October 25th, 1998, 98, it's not that time. We're going to start all over again. 1988. That is correct. October 25th, 1988, the Ingram family had actually sat down and watched the Geraldo Rivera special titled Devil Worship Exposing Satan's Underground. Oh, what a- the day before the special aired, Rivera's special was titled... Oh, this is all on TV. I remember. Yeah. I, remember, I don't remember watching it, but I remember Gerardo Rivera. Before this special, the day before, was titled Satanic Breeders, Babies for Sacrifice. 
In these specials, Rivera interviewed children who claimed to have been victims of satanic ritual abuse and who have born and to have been born into a cult. They often detailed experiences that they were sexually abused not only by family members, but by friends of the family as well. Books like Michelle Remembers and Geraldo Rivera's specials became extremely popular among Christian groups as they detailed a world in which Satan was out to get them, and in every corner, this upheld a common belief that was already expressed and discussion in churches around the country. Especially for those in Pentecostal, Pentecostal churches, the idea that a cabal of Satanists were kidnapping, abusing, torturing, and killing America's youth was something that was often discussed and made to be a common, a common enemy for the church to rally against. Was there any proof ever? Just a bunch of bitchy people. No. Yeah. Nothing, no one has ever been charged for a crime yeah. related to the satanic yeah, panic, just, yeah, except for Paul Ingram. They often excuse the lack of evidence present in these cases by making ridiculous claims, this is my personal opinion, mm. and making cult members appear to be far more intelligent as well as far more calculating and manipulative. Some of the claims include children being drugged, mm -hmm. Animals that are sacrificed and buried in one place only to, be, only to be moved and reburied so as to take witnesses or so as to make witnesses unsure of their own memories. Photographs and videos of sexual abuse and sacrifice are kept locked away by members and those of the upper echelon of government as well as those in the higher echelons of society. Pretty much Hollywood. The satanic panic was a weird and odd melting between two usually divided sections of society, that of the religious right and that of science, or in other words, psychiatry and psychology. Thank you for the demonstration, by the way. Right. It was beautiful. <laughs> psychiatry. Is that what you said, psychiatry? Okay. Yeah, psychiatry as well as psychology. Okay. Um, there are three ways to pretty much take claims. Tom, Tom Cruise about the satanic panic. You could dismiss the claims as absurd. You could withhold judgment until more evidence was presented, or you could take the claims completely seriously and true based on faith. Those who did not readily accept the claims as true were often chastised or placed into a group of satanic offenders working underground. It does seem odd that as the United States tapered off its war against communism, found a new common enemy, and the satanic State. underground. Listen was to heavy metal. Uh -huh. Listen to their heavy metal. Hell yeah, dude. Q Metallica. Killing the kids, dude. You can't play Metallica. Slayer. You can't play anything. So you, I guess we'll have to write a song then, dude. Mm -hmm. And cue our song. We're not going to do that. That's not happening. Don't let them fool you. What you do to don't That's do not copyrighted for Jim Ray. <laughs> yes. It's in its likeness? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll cut that too. <laughs> it was often discussed, just as there was a fear of communism infiltrating the highest levels of government, that now individuals pledging to Satan were infiltrating those exact same higher offices, both local as well as in the national communities. One more time. In 1988, Los Angeles County Commission for Women formed a task force to investigate the rise in satanic ritual abuse. A report resulted from the task force that described satanic ritual abuse as... I'm going to point to you because this is where your first reading comes in. SRA. I have to read something? Yeah. You have an entire... It's like a full paragraph here. Oh, I don't know how to read. Starts at the top. Right there? Yep, that whole thing in white. A brutal form of abuse of children, adolescents, and adults consisting of physical, sexual, and or physiological abuse and involving the use of rituals. Ritual does not necessarily mean satanic. However, most survivors state that they were ritually abused as part of satanic worship for the purpose of indoctrinating mm -hmm. oh, nice, dude. them into satanic beliefs and practices. The report goes on to claim the purpose of ritual elements of the abuse seems, therefore, number one. Threefold. Oh, threefold. Sorry, I'm blind. 
the rituals in some groups are part of shared belief of worship systems into which the victim is being indoctrinated. Number two, rituals are used to intimidate victims into silence. Number three, rituals, elements, EEG, devil worship, animal, or human sacrifice seem to unbelievable to those unfamiliar with those crimes. These elements detract from the credibility of the victims and make prosecution of the crimes very difficult. Boom. I blacked out. Wow. <laughs> I read a whole thing, dude. <laughs> so pretty much what they say is like satanic abuse has three main things. Um, they are an indoctrination of those involved. Uh, they are meant to intimidate victims of the satanic ritual abuse. Mm -hmm. And the third thing, they do things that are so ridiculous that no one would ever take them as real. Because they're so ridiculous. That's like how they describe satanic ritual abuse as like those threefold parts. Indoctrination, silencing, and it's so ridiculous, no one could possibly believe it. That's what they're saying is the like satanic ritual abuse actually does those things. It doesn't really say that like maybe they're ridiculous claims because they're not real. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the report concludes by saying the purpose of the mind control is to compel ritual abuse victims to keep secret of their to keep secret their abuse, to conform to the beliefs and behaviors of the cult, and to become functioning members who serve the cult by carrying out the directives of its leaders without being detected by the society at large. Well, this may seem like a lot of in-depth information. It needs to be discussed since this is a depiction of the cultural zeitgeist, i.e. thoughts or feelings on the culture at the time of the Paul Ingram case. I find it particularly interesting that the third report makes, or that the third part of the report concerns the idea that the ritual elements employed by these cults make the abuse of the victims seem so absurd and surreal that it can be hard to actually take any claims of such, such abuse as real. Remember this part of the report as we go forward, as the claims we're about to get into are beyond imagination and portray the victims of such abuse as insane. Can you give me some whiskey? Am sure. I Am I your servant? Sure. Oh, uh, because you're reading? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep reading. Say when. While the phenomenon of SRA had permeated both the religious and scientific community, it soon afterwards became a prime interest of those involved in law enforcement, as oftentimes detectives were charged with investigating the alleged assaults by a vast network of alleged cults. Joe Vukic recalls going to a homicide seminar in Portland, Oregon, where a detective from Boise, Idaho, gave a presentation on cult crimes. It became common practice for these workshops to take place across the entire country, featuring author and subject of previously mentioned and often debunked Michelle Remembers. Vukic and Shoning would later join this circuit during the Ingram investigation and would be referred to as experts on satanic ritual abuse, as well as recovered memories. We're now going to introduce a new character. His name is Kenneth Lanning. Early in the Ingram case, Under Sheriff Neil McClanahan calls supervisory agent Kenneth V. Lanning at the Behavioral Science Unit of the FBI to get his thoughts on the case. Lanning was the FBI's expert on the sexual victimization of children and had been hearing stories of sexual abuse with occult overtones since the early 80s. While at first Lanning took the disclosures at face value and believed them to be true, the absolute shocking amount of reports of SRA caused in him a stirring of doubt. Let's look at some numbers here. By the mid-80s, the annual number of alleged satanic murders had reached the tens of thousands. From information provided by a prison official in Utah and often discussed and repeated in aforementioned police workshops, it was believed <coughs> that satanic cults were sacrificing between 50 and 60,000 people a year. That's a lot. To put that in perspective. To, ne yeah. to never been proven. To put that in perspective, during this time in the United States, the 
national average of homicides was less than 25,000 in total. So somehow the number of victims of satanic murders more than doubled the number of actual victims of homicide in any given year. Those who believed these outrageous accounts contended that no bodies were found in relation to these rituals, as Satanists often ate their victims and had sophisticated methods of disposal. Perfect crime. Right? Eat all the remains. Dude. It's... It kind of is. Yeah, dude. Just saving cereal, man. Dude, you just, like, <laughs> fucking eat all the meat. Grind the bones to make your bread, dude. You have bone broth. You don't even need to go to the store anymore, dude. You're shopping on discount. Just murder someone. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Fucking I think five yeah. faux foam, dude. Be a giant. Grind your bones to make their bread, dude. Oh. Uh, don't actually kill someone. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> We're not. We are sure just specified. joking. We are not advocating ever. We are. Murder. Or cannibalism. We are we are big wussies that couldn't murder anyone ever. Yeah, I don't even like. I cry. Apparently, you're supposed to he- eat like human meat, like well done. And like, I hate meat well done. How do you know this? Who says this? <laughs> Who told you? I don't know. What do you mean I don't know? You can't just say that. It's it is. Who? It's from where, a, where? From a podcast that I what? just recently listened to. Where they talk about eating human meat? Yep. Like, what story? Like, Dahmer? Um, no, not Dahmer. Okay. Um, it's, it's the last podcast. They're, like, oh. a huge influence on, oh, on I know. this podcast. Well, you can, you can, yeah, oh, they're covering, obviously. They're covering this guy that uh, pretty much, like, yeah. he's not, he didn't murder someone per se, he found a willing sacrifice. Like this guy wanted to die and he wanted to eat someone. I think I remember hearing about this. Yeah. Uh, it, it didn't happen that long ago. It was no. 2000. I, I really, I think it was like, I remember hearing it in the yeah. news. Yeah, it's not that long ago. Yeah, you were probably in high school. He said, you yes. fucking old bastard. Were you not in high school in the 2000s? The late, I, I graduated in 2009. Yeah, I graduated in 2013. Like five years what? ever. Did. No, two thousand thir- from college. No, from high school, two thousand thirteen, two thousand three. <laughs> I am so speechless right now. It's like, wait, what are you? I'm just fucking. <laughs> like, fuck! I don't. What are you, dumb idiot? Fucking <laughs> <laughs> records, Jesus. Yeah, dude, I've been telling you this whole time that I was older than you, but actually, oh wow, man. I'm actually just... Dude, are you serious? <laughs> I just poured... You didn't see? I poured the whole fucking... I poured the whole fucking bottle in here. No. And I poured a little tiny drop in mine. Oh, fucking... Don't be impressed with me. Get drunk. Get, get drunk, dude. Don't call me a wuss, dude. Cheers. All right. Where were we? Here we go. Here we go. Girls with smoky this men. All right. All right. It is an important distinction that we need to make that there have been killers who have claimed to be doing their work in the name of Satan. Richard Ramirez comes to mind initially, but there are two important caveats to mention. So to say. One, Son of Sam didn't do any work for Satan. His dog just told him to do it. His dog was talking to Satan. Are you sure? Yes. We'll check back. I, I don't know. I actually don't know that. Richard, Mar- R- Richard Ramirez... Was the one in California, yeah. right? The one with the bad teeth, and he said Satan told him to do all that. Yeah. Son of Sam showed up with fucking was like, the guy that shot. Yeah, he shot a couple people in New York. He shot like six people up in New York, yeah. and then they found out that they, that they tied into a whole satanic cult. And he he confessed later that he wasn't the only one. He's like, hey, there was actually three other people. I I don't know enough about the case, so I'm not going to say that you're wrong at all. Well, I also I like, like I've also been like, drinking. Also a total cop out, dude. Like. Oh, yeah, I, like, totally didn't do this by myself. It was definitely Satan, where it's like, Ramirez, from the beginning, was, like, writing shit on walls, like, Satan lives here and shit like that. It's almost like if someone was like, I don't know if I did this, maybe I did. Exactly like that. (laughs) Okay. Yep. Solved it. The first caveat... Just as there have been killers who have claimed to be killing for the sake of Satan, the number is 
significantly dwarfed by those who have killed in the name of God in whatever sense of the word they are looking at. Um, the second Isn't that the yeah. guy that killed John Lennon, didn't he say he did it because of oh, God? Yeah. Lots of people have killed because mostly prostitutes because they're like, they have a messiah complex and they're like, oh, I'm like doing the world a favor by getting rid of these prostitutes. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, it's narcolepsism. <laughs> Narcolepsism. Yep. <laughs> um, the second caveat and the more important part is that according to Lanning, in his review of Lanning is the FBI guy that um McClanahan is talking to right now. Sweet, thank you. Uh in his review, all murders that are actually sat- attributed to satanic beliefs, none of them were part of a cult. In fact, Lanning was unable to find any documented cases where more than one person was involved and were claiming to be killing or sacrificing victims in the name of Satan, thus making the cult part of these reports highly suspect, if not flat out false. Does that make sense? No. He's saying (laughs) straight up, I've looked through all of the reports that, you know, because people, it's not, it's never like not been done. Like there are people that are claiming to murder in the sake of Satan. Uh Uh-huh. It's never been more than one person, though. Like you're talking about. So it hasn't been like three, three, three people. It's not like, oh, yeah, we're all doing this for Satan. Mm. Eliminating the fact that like a cult angle even exists because no evidence has ever shown up or multiple people have been even convicted of a crime where there's, they're all doing it for the sake of Satan. I'm pretty sure it's the same, dude. Yeah, but, I mean, are you calling his dog a conspirator? Maybe. Oh, shit. I've never even thought about it. Did the dog go to jail? Dogs don't go to jail. Does he go to the pound? <laughs> they all go to heaven. Do you think he went to the pound? All dude? dogs go to hell heaven, dude. You know, I don't know that. What do you think? Straight up, I'd like to... I think that's a funny skit. What? Of, like, what happens to fucking... <laughs> dogs that murder. Son of Sam's dog <laughs> after fucking... He goes to jail. Well, if dogs, he just goes to another home. I doubt it. <laughs> and it's all of a sudden, it's like the Amityville horror. <laughs> Satanic dog ruins family. Nice. No, but he just keeps flying under the radar because, like, Sex. he's just whispering, like, just fucking kill that bitch. He probably have a second glass of wine. Let's be do it. She's being too hard on you. Gosh, you're such a bitch. You should probably yeah, that. Maybe you should look about it. Maybe we should look up what happened to the dog. You want me to do that right now? No. Oh, well, we'll, we'll address it by the next episode. Psych. Yeah. But like, I think that that's a hilarious, like, you could make an entire movie about yeah, the pretty... son of son of Sam. The son of son of Sam. Yeah. It's like, you, you see that movie Pets? No. I didn't even oh, the Damian one with Will Ferrell and stuff? I don't know. Is it the one with Will Ferrell and uh, Jamie Foxx? It's the oh. animated one by Pixar. Oh, no. The Secret Life of Pets? Yeah, that's the one. Secret Life of Pets. I am yeah, sorry. sorry. That's my bad. I didn't clarify these. Is it the movie title. Pets? No. Have you? No. 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 I haven't seen it. Then why are we fucking talk about it? That's fair. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> uh, and it's called McClanahan. Landing reported these findings and relayed that after looking into hundreds of similar stories regarding SRA, he had come to the conclusion that these reports were merely a symptom of modern mass hysteria. To this, McClanahan responded that that the Ingram case was different. He had a perpetrator who was readily confessing to the alleged crimes, implicating fellow cult members, and that there was more than more evidence to come, such as photographs of the alleged abuse and scars on the reporting victims that could corroborate SRA. Lanning ended that call claiming that if all of that was true, quote, you've got more than anybody else. It was after this call that McClanahan realized just how important the Ingram case was. It was the one case in America that could prove finally that satanic ritual abuse was real. No. That's what they're saying, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's still not. What? People in the 80s are weird. Yeah, they're all fucking nuts. So, 
I don't know what you want to say. They're, like, these guys were dying so hard to have a case that fucking mattered. This is Olympia, Washington in the early 80s. Mid, I guess it's late 80s. They want, they want it to be real. Everyone does. Like, all these... Do you think it's because it'll prove that God is real? No. Uh, if, Satan, just if, Satan, if Satan is real, then that means God is real? Like we mentioned earlier, dude, these detectives are, like, going on tour. And like, hey, we are the foremost uh, yeah. like experts on satanic ritual abuse, and they have this dude that's just straight up admitting the shit that he's never fucking money, done before. Money, yes, money, exactly. money, money, money. A lot of fucking up. money. I'm out of their normal pay. Yeah, bunch of dip shits. It's just crazy. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, the revelations from Ingram and his daughters were oftentimes contradictory. Investigators in the Thurston County Sheriff's Office were convinced that they were dealing with the first criminal case capable of proving the existence of satanic ritual abuse. In December of 1988, Sandy Ingram, Paul's wife, used a scratch pad to write the following. Oh, here's where I come in. Hello, here I come. I'm going to have a drink now. Red. Questions to ask God. Yeah, get get excited about it. Dude. Low battery, twenty percent. I don't think I'm supposed to read that part. Has my has my life been a lie? Have I hidden or suppressed bad things that happened in the past? Have I been brainwashed, oppressed, depressed, or controlled without knowing it? Oscar. <laughs> Scene. And scene. <laughs> While Paul and his children were the focus of perhaps the first ever provable case of re- provable case regarding satanic ritual abuse, mm-hmm. Sandy watched from the outside, wondering what happened to her picture perfect family. Two days after Paul's arrest, Sandy went in to visit Paul in jail. The couple was now divided by not just a cloudy piece of plexiglass, but also a number of shocking developments that put the nature of their entire relationship into question. It was during this time that Sandy, horrified, discussed the case with Paul. During this meeting, Paul relayed that Pastor John Bratoon had instructed Paul to make confessions about the case. Paul also revealed that he was instructed by Bratoon to confess to Sandy about an affair Paul had mentioned, or about the affair that we had mentioned in the previous episode. Mm-hmm. Some, like, mid-40s chick, Paul yeah. was in his 30s. He was getting after it because it wasn't his wife, pretty much. That's some affairs. Sandy was devastated by this news. The revelation seemed to shatter any remaining belief that she claimed against her husband were patently false. She found herself thinking about how, if she hadn't known or noticed anything about Paul's affair, what else might she have missed? Sandy left the jail feeling lost and alone, and this would just be the beginning. Her daycare license would be suspended shortly after Paul's arrest. With Paul in jail, her only source of income suspended, how was she to take care of her youngest son, Mark, who at the time of Paul's arrest was only nine? All of her children besides her youngest son, Mark, had left the house, and Mark spent most of the days in school. No loud house full of daycare children, no husband home for lunch, no household duties that Sandy came to cherish, such as work as cooking dinner, doing loads of laundry. Sandy's loneliness and loss of children, or loss of direction, had reached a fever pitch by mid-December 1988. But this loneliness and loss of purpose would be very, very short-lived. In late December, investigators came to become concerned with Sandy's role in the abuse of their children. Both Erica and Julie had denied their mother was involved when they were first in discussions with police. However, as is often the story with this case, as deve- as it- Detectives repeatedly questioned the girls. Eventually, the girls would remember an event and implicate their mother. Detectives would often would often ask the girls, as they described these scenes of abuse, particularly over the poker nights, how their mother could have been oblivious to the dreadful events they described it. Bit by bit, under the scrutiny of detectives, the girls would admit to their mother's participation. Erica would first implicate Sandy in discussions with a friend of hers who was also being interviewed by police. 
Her, flan- her friend claimed that when men at the poker parties would come into the girls' room, their mother would sit on the edge of the bed and watch the men assault the girls. When the friend replied, Your mother was cheering section? Eric replied, She wouldn't do anything. She, would- she wouldn't say anything. She'd just watch. Her friend, shocked, exclaimed, We're talking about your mother. To which Erica replied, It was strange. This interaction would be documented and used as evidence by investigators. What did the mom say after that? After she heard her daughter say that she was there. So this is... Sandy is not even talked to by investigators yet. They're like, what is her deal with this? And so Erica and her friend are being interviewed because Erica can't be interviewed alone. She has to have someone there that she can tell what to say to detectives. Why? That's just the way that this entire case goes. You have Julie, who will make uh, disclosures by writing them down. Paul, who will go into these, like, what they would call, like, fugue states, where he, like, goes into a trance and recalls things. Speaking in tongues. And you have Erica, who will tell a friend what to tell detectives. That's kind of how this whole thing keeps going. Um, Weird. At a later point, another friend of Erica's related to police that Erica had revealed to her. She claimed that Erica told her that Sandy's role was to come in before the men arrived and, quote, get her ready. Vukic was also told by this friend, she said that her mother would be touching her vagina at times. Detective Vukic asked the friend, did she say that it was strictly for the purpose of getting her ready? Or her mother was, in fact, sexually abusing her. To this, the friend responded, she used the word sexually abused. In this conversation with Erica's friend, it would be discovered that this had happened as recently as twice in the most recent September of 1988. This friend also claimed that Erica had wondered if she had been given drugs by her parents that affected her memory. She claimed that sometimes she had a hard time remembering an event, and then all of a sudden it would come back to her, and she didn't know why she couldn't remember it in the first place. I should mention that these interviews took place before Sandy was ever brought in for questioning by detectives, and that the timeline on all of this is somewhat cloudy. On December 8th, 1988, Detective Vukic and Laura Lee Thompson had an interview with Erica to address the claims that had been made by Erica's friends. Detectives reported that she was in good spirits and was fairly talkative about the case until about her mother's role and the abuse. At this point, Erica became withdrawn and only communicated by nodding or shaking her head. Eventually, Erica would describe a scene in which she was 9 or 10 years old. Her mother entered a room, followed by her father, Jim Raby, and Ray Rich. Followed by her father, Jim Raby, and Ray Rich. Raby strapped her naked and made her pose while he took photographs. She claimed Rish held her at gunpoint. Erica claimed this scenario had happened many times. She claimed her mother had watched but had not participated. Detective Thompson left the interview after this disclosure to meet with Julie Ingram in another room. So far, it was only Erica and her friends who had made any claims to detectives about her mother's involvement. When Thompson asked Julie if her mother had ever been present when bad things happened to her, Julie replied, I don't think so. Thompson then was asked when the last time Rish or Raby had photographed her was. The interview reads as follows. I'll be Thompson. Julie responds, responding to the initial question claimed, I was six years old. Thompson, where? My bedroom. Where was Erica while all of this was happening? (laughs) That's a shrug. Where was your mother? Julie had no response. Julie, who often detailed her abuses through written confessions, then wrote that Raby and Rish had put their hands all over her body and told her that she was special. After viewing what Julie had written, she asked if anybody else was in the room, to which Julie then wrote, My mom. Thompson asked if her mother had said anything to her, and she replied, She told me to be a good girl and that no one was hurting me. After which, Julie began sobbing and Thompson entered, ended the interview. The day following, 
The interviews with both Erica and Julie, detectives examined the Ingram home, hoping to find evidence of, photo, of the photo sessions or photos themselves. All that police found at the Ingram home was Sandy at the dining table in the dark, knitting a hat. It was at this point that police informed Sandy of her rights and that she was under investigation for her involvement in the photography sessions and her sexually touching Erica. Did they ever find pictures? I, I know the answer. They didn't. No. No evidence is ever found in this entire case. So, like, as soon as you think, like, oh, well, did they find anything that corroborated that evidence? No. And that's including uh, scars. It's including stories. It's including burials. It's including tables. It's including barns that were used. Not even, like, how long did Ingram go to jail for? 15 years? 15 years. Not even like a cellmate? It's like, yo, dude, no nope. consent. Never. Yep. Must be Satan. <laughs> Satan, like, right. shut the fuck up. <laughs> before detectives, before leaving, detectives asked, who are you most afraid of, Ray or Jim? Sandy fired back, I'm not afraid of anybody, and called her lawyer, which is when the detectives left her home. Sandy admitted that while she made appeared strong in the action, she was in fact on a full-on panic and her life was falling to pieces. Her perfect life was being plastered on front pages of newspapers as a sham. Her marriage was over. Her own children were, accused her, were accusing her of sexual abuse. She began to doubt herself and wondered if she had a hidden dark side like Paul claimed he must have. Child Protective Services had been called to have Mark taken from Sandy. This anonymous caller was recorded as Erica, hoping to claim custody for Mark herself. Sandy worried that unless she admitted to the abuse taking place in her home, she would be deemed in denial and would therefore be declared an unfit parent. On December 16th, Sandy went to visit Pastor John Bertoon, the same pastor that had spoken with Paul. Bertoon had inserted himself in the case from the very get-go providing counsel to both Sandy and Paul. Sandy's visit was in hopes to receive some more counseling about her next moves concerning Mark and the claims that the girls had made against her. Sandy had also had always felt that she could trust Bertoon and was quite upset when asking for help. Bertoon responded that she was 80% evil. As mentioned, Bertoon's involvement with the case was extensive and oftentimes he was privy to information on the case even before the police were. After this biting remark about Sandy's being evil, he mirrored a train of thought that he had overheard from detectives, claiming that either she knew that she knew what was going on in the house, or she was just directly involved, and would probably be going to jail unless she confessed to the crimes, even if she didn't remember doing them. To this, Sin replied, That may work with some people, but it won't work on me. Cindy left the pastor's home, now completely aware of how alone she was. Her last tie to the outside world, her church, had also abandoned her. Upon arriving home from her interaction with Pastor Bertoon, she gathered up her things, bundled up Mark against the cold winter December, and fled to her relatives across the state in Spokane. Apparently Sandy hardly ever drove, and was afraid to even get on the highway while driving. This did not deter her from making the trek across the state of Washington through a complete blizzard. On December 18th, Detectives Vukic and Schoening finally located, located Paul Ross, the oldest son, uh, the oldest Ingram son in Reno, Nevada. When, direct, when detectives first arrived at his apartment, he was not home, so they left a note on his door asking for Paul Ross to call them. He would call at 8.30 the following morning, asking if this was about an outstanding warrant he still had in Thurston County for beating someone's car with a bat. Yeah, that's about right. Detectives informed him that this had nothing to do with that, but that his father and his several colleagues were in jail, his sisters were in protective custody, and the rest of his family was safe. Detectives did not inform him of the charges against his, what the charges against his father were, but when he sat down to meet with detectives a few hours later, he guessed that the charges were related to a sexual offense. Really? Yeah. In, like, lesser words, he was like, I bet it's something to do with 
sexual fuck on someone that he shouldn't have or something like that. These interviews are not readily available. I didn't get like a whole lot of uh, source material directly regarding like what was because like I have a lot of this from here on out that's like quoted direct from interviews. The the interviews with Paul Ross are not that way. They are uh, summarized in this source right. material. Um, detectives interviewing Paul Ross found him angry and hostile as well as evasive. He claimed at one point, I'd like to shoot my dad. I've always hated him. He was not surprised by the fact that his father was in jail, as he claimed his father has been physically abusive to him. He related a story that one time his father had thrown an axe at him. Jeez. In the story, Paul Ingram was on the back deck using an axe to cut wood. His sons Chad and Paul Ross were playing on the ground below. In frustration about the axe being dull, Paul threw the axe off the deck, and had Paul Ross not moved, the axe would have hit him. I bring up the story for one key point. While the story itself may or may not be an accident, and may or may not detail physical abuse, is the first and only time in this case where an event is detailed to detectives separately by two different witnesses. Both Paul Ross and Chad, the other son, told the story the exact same way. Paul Ingram also remembered this event clearly and expressed that it hurt him as he had surprised and scared his boys. He even believed the incident to be the reason for Paul Ross leaving the Ingram home. During Paul Ross's interview with Vukic and Shoning, the detectives pressed him to remember instances of sexual abuse around the house when he was younger. Paul denied ever having noticed any sexual abuse around the house. Paul Ross did confirm the poker parties that took place at the Ingram home. He also picked Raby and Rish out from a photo lineup. Does it say when he left the home? Uh, he was 18. Okay. Yeah. We so made it seem... Talked it in the last episode. Yeah, right. um, he, like, was the dude that, like, crashed the car. Yeah. And then was like, I'm fucking... Yeah, like, in, like, two three, months, crashed cars? the cars. Yeah. yeah. He left, like, when he was, like, 18. Okay. Um, he just made it seem like... Paul's like, that's why he left home. He's like, yeah, I was 18. That's when, that's when you leave. Okay. Yeah. I would say don't trust anything that Paul, Paul Ingram, not Paul Ross, but Paul Ingram has to say because he's delusional. He's the satanic in sheriff. my idea. He's the satanic He's sheriff. also the satanic has, sheriff. Baby, has, guns for he, Satan. He has men mental health issues. All right. I'm going to take a drink. All right. um, during Paul Ross's interview with Vukic and Shonen, the detectives pressed him to remember instances of sexual abuse around the house when he was younger. Paul denied ever having noticed any sexual abuse around their house. Paul Ross did confirm that the po poker parties took place. He picked out Raby and Rish from a photo lineup. And in reference to these two men, he said that he did not like Jim Raby and that Rish was, quote, a gay guy. At one point, detectives backed Paul Ross against the wall and told him, we know you're a victim. At this point, Paul Ross revealed that once he was in his early teens, he heard some muffled screaming sounds at night and went to investigate. He found his parents' door ajar and claimed that he saw his mother bound to her bed with belts and Jim Raby and his father, Paul Ingram, having sex with his mother. He said that Ray Rish and another man were in the corner jacking each other off. Paul Ingram noticed his son in the doorway and hit his eldest son, Paul Ross, in the face, who, at this point, Paul Ross went down into the kitchen and poured himself a glass of whiskey. He claimed that he became an alcoholic on that night. He was like 13 when this happened. On December 20th, detectives again met with Erica and her friend Paula Davis at the Thurston County Sheriff's Department in a room specifically designed by Jim Raby to interview child victims of sexual assault. Detectives asked Erica if their brothers or sisters had ever discussed abu abuse with her, and she replied no. Bukic also managed to get Erica to admit that the last time Raby had molested her was three months ago, in September 1988. Shortly after the submission, Erica requested a break in the interview. When Joe Vukic left the room, he was able to look back in through a small window and see Erica and Paula had gotten out of their chairs and moved to the floor. 
Erica was curled up in Paula's lap, sobbing. When detectives came back into the room, they pressed Erica about this incident, that it happened three months before in the later part of September. When detectives Thompson asked, did Jim Raby make you do something to him? Erica replied quietly, yes. The detectives pressed her further on what Raby had made her do, at which Erica requested to go to the bathroom. Detectives claimed they could hear Erica retching through the door of the bathroom and sent Paula Davis to check on her friend. A while after, Erica emerged with a written account detailing Raby's assault. You ready? Mm hmm Upon returning, Erica gave a statement to Vukic, who then proceeded to read it aloud for the record. It reads... Oh, I have to read this? I was asleep in my room in bed and heard Jim Raby come in, and that's when I looked up and saw him. He started touching me with his hands first on the outside of my sweats, then underneath. He touched my chest and, and on my private parts, front and back. He inserted his fingers in the front. Oh, I don't like this. <laughs> it's all bad. He inserted his fingers in, in, the fr in my front and in my back parts. He forced my head to his front part. Then he stopped and said, I knew what would happen if I, if what, or then I, he, then he stopped and said, I knew what would happen if I told. Then he urinated all over my body in bed. He didn't, he, he didn't defecate on me at this time. Vukic could barely control his emotions after finishing reading the statement. Yeah, no shit. He asked if Raby had defecated on her before, to which Erica answered, yes. When the interview ended, Vukic took the report and slammed it on his lieutenant's desk, screaming, that son of a bitch shit on her. He recalled never before having been so emotionally attached to a victim before. He claimed he felt like a protective older brother. However, it was joked about nervously in the department that perhaps he was falling in love with Erica Ingram. That's gross. And I think that's where we'll end it for tonight. <laughs> this shit's gross from here on out, dude. It's all bad. Yeah. What, you shitting on people? It's That's, like, not the bad part. Oh. You have so many more things to, like... Because you, you're you're gonna read all the victims. Why do you make me read the bad parts? Because I'm trying to include you, dude. <laughs> you make you make me. <laughs> all right. That being said, uh, thank you everyone for listening. Please like and subscribe. Um, do all those things. Yeah, I guess we're doing part three. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be a part three. Yeah, and no, not a part four. We won't do part four. I'll be able to get it through it by the next time. Thank you. Um, yeah, guys. Bye. Thanks for liking. Thanks for subscribing. It's the real deal. He'll say new. You can't say that. That's what they say on the last podcast. Oh, that's, that's true. They're stealing their shit. Read down those demons. <laughs> oh, you drink the whole thing. I can't drink that much right now.